So, do we start? I think so. So, dear all, welcome to this very important uh, last panel with the title 6G and Beyond 5G Prospects for the Virgin Industry. And I hope you had an enjoying week for the last uh, two days. And uh, my name is Marcus Stillinger, and I have the pleasure to moderate and introduce you to the background and speakers. We have actually two honored and very experienced panelists coming from diverse backgrounds like automotive, e-health, manufacturing, maritime, mobile networks, and academia for 6G or beyond 5G expectations at present the virtual industry. The organization is as follows of the panel. We will have six presentations with each eight minutes. And around about after one hour, we will have the discussion with the chat tool. So I hope that the audience uh, is been made aware to raise questions over the chat channel. And in the last 30 minutes, uh, we will hopefully address all these questions and uh, hopefully punctually close at 1 p.m. So my introduction is, is as follows, as you also have seen in the outline, I guess the uh, discussions about uh, beyond 5G or 6G uh, or 5G evolution have started around about two years ago. And the discussed concepts are still back and circling around higher order MIMO AI dispute computing. For the vertical industry, it's very difficult to understand potential benefits, threats, opportunities, or even weaknesses of the future concepts. Still, 5G is not fully commercially in place for vertical applications. For instance, 5G Lee 16 is still to come for commercial cars. And 5G Lee 16 does not offer all features of the, for the manufacturing industry requirements. So the vertical sectors need urgently to get involved in such discussions to avoid useless 6G strategies and insufficient solutions. The new solution should not just uh, be an extrapolation of the known 5G concepts by increasing MIMO orders, and higher processing powers. Moreover, 6G must also address, for example, energy savings by making more intelligent use of resources and offering new use cases, which were not yet addressed too much in 5G. For example, you can imagine to have also activities in CGP, maybe another SA working group, which uh, can work on energy management concepts across manufacturers. This is still yet to be done. We have many places there for security and architecture, but not really well addressed uh, climate uh, saving me mechanisms. So we will uh, also foresee around 6G new capabilities uh, by merging sensing communication technologies, new short range use cases like body air networks and the emerging of non-terrestrial networks is integral part of the 6G story. The panelists will try to identify new 6G tech enablers and concept, and we will discuss their potential benefits or concerns for the automotive, e-health, manufacturing, maritime, and other verticals. As you know, uh, for e-health, uh, this has been uh, more like left behind uh, automotive and manufacturing the last years. We still have important applications like wireless patient monitoring, uh, mobile system access, medical devices, smart pharmaceuticals, robotics, telehealthcare, and ambient assistant living. So uh, now for the panel, we have several points for discussions. What are the new directions of 6G in particular for vertical use cases? What are the shortcomings of 5G in general? And uh, we have to see what are the uh, topics we have heard the last uh, more or less two days uh, about new requirements like integrated sensing and communication, terahertz, advanced uh, sub communication, uh, factor X more bandwidth, and um, of course, much delays. So we have to see uh, how this could be more or less addressed by the panelists. And we have six distinguished speakers. So the first one is Professor Nancy Anastasiotti from University of Athens. Mr. Antonio fernandez Barciella, He is uh, from uh, Celandis, the merger of BSA and FCA. And I think number four in the world for the automotive car industry. Then we have Dr. Andreas Müller from Bosch. He is here head for corporate research, but also uh, 5G as chairman. Uh, Mr. Frederick uh, Thibault from Anitokomo in Munich, and uh, he's also directed there. Professor Tümler from Helios Hospital, he's taking care for elderly people, uh, medical uh, care. And last but not least, uh, our well distinguished uh, CTO, Mr. George Grasa from uh, NOS, NOS, uh, Portuguese uh, Telecommunication and Media Company. So welcome uh, uh, to the colleagues and nice uh, that you have accepted the invitations and also uh, hope that the audience has a good, enjoyable, informative session. 
A few notes uh, for my person. I'm head of R&D for 6G and beyond 5G vertical communications located in Munich, Germany. Now, I propose to start with our first uh, panelist. So I will also briefly introduce our panelists and then I would like uh, uh, to ask our panelists to start with their uh, presentation or statements uh, for the last, uh, for the next uh, 60 minutes round about. So Professor Nancy Alostiotti, she is Associate Professor in Informatics and Telecommunication in the Department of Informatics and Telecommunication, uh, of which she is currently Vice Chair of the University of Athens. She has over 20 years of experience in numerous national and European projects, including project technical management experiences. She is currently leading the SCAN group activities there. She has served as member of the Future Internet Assembly Steering Committee, recent activities and projects uh, in the areas of 5G. Then uh, she is also uh, doing activities in smart cities, smart maritime projects. She is also a member of the uh, ETSI uh, expert groups and of the Greek standardization group, uh, ELOT. She has over 150 publications in the area of mobile networks, NGI, SCN, NFV, IoT, and AI smart city, maritime applications, autonomy communications, and computer uh, mobile systems. She is co-author of four worldwide uh, patents and has more than 2,500 citations. So welcome here. And um, Nancy, I would like to give you the screen sharing and please start with your first presentation. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Is it okay? Yes. Thank you. So I, I start uh, with some uh, uh, discussion uh, about the vertical domain uh, related to the maritime sector. Uh, the maritime sector is a quite complex uh, uh, ecosystem. Uh, our group and our uh, university is member of the Greek, the Hellenic, the Greek actually uh, maritime cluster and uh, member of the Blue Growth Center of Excellence in Greece. Uh, through this uh, opportunity, we are able to uh, have a very close contact with uh, maritime uh, uh, sector companies uh, and we support them in various activities related to uh, the digitalization, the new technology innovations that can be applied to maritime and to data analytics and other, uh, other AI-based uh, solutions for the maritime. So through this uh, collaboration, we have uh, several access to uh, surveys that uh, uh, actually identify the main uh, challenges for, for the maritime sector related to the co communications and uh, connectivity. Uh, one major issue at this moment for the maritime sector is the sustainability issue uh, and the efficiency in terms of cost uh, and uh, performance for connectivity for the communications, for the maritime communications. The sustainability is very important since there is a, uh, from IMO a recommendation to reduce the maritime emissions by 40% by 2030. This is a big challenge uh, that requires a lot of uh, technology innovation to be applied in the maritime sector in order to monitor and manage uh, the, uh, the, the emission uh, 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 footprint and the carbon footprint per ship and per route. And this uh, requires a uh, uh, technologies to, to uh, support uh, this uh, endeavor in order to reach the goals. So there is a big uh, push for uh, advanced uh, communication technologies, high performance uh, communication technologies that can support a massive amount of uh, uh, sensors and uh, devices that can be connected on board uh, and provide uh, a, a good overview of uh, the uh, status of, of the operation of the ships and the route based on the routes that, that, they, tra uh, trans uh, that they travel. And uh, with this, it is uh, imperative to increase the capacity uh, at, at the sea, uh, at, during the sea routes and uh, increase the uh, integration of uh, several uh, 
let's say, access uh, technologies uh, around the, these routes. Another important aspect is the use of uh, capacity uh, in terms of uh, speed and uh, uh, network capacity in order to support heavy, let's say, uh, applications like 3D printing, which uh, is one of the main challenges uh, in order to reduce uh, the times uh, uh, that are required for uh, new um, uh, spare parts to be introduced in a ship. For the moment, uh, many ships are, uh, are required to stay uh, two or three weeks in a port in order to uh, receive a, a new spare part uh, for the maintenance of their ship. So th this is uh, not cost effective anymore uh, with the demand uh, that uh, is raising at, uh, at this period. And uh, now new approaches are considered for solving the maintenance and uh, the uh, support of uh, the, uh, the, the remaining time to port. So one major issue is the reduction of uh, the emissions, the reduction of the time that the ships spend uh, near to the ports, and uh, also some technologies that relate to the maintenance and uh, also augmented reality for maintenance and training activities uh, for the crews on, on, on board. Um, there are several other challenges, environmental monitoring, uh, automation, piloting and bunkering automation, uh, safety applications that uh, require uh, uh, much more capacity that is available at the moment uh, for the ships. And uh, since uh, the 5G uh, has not focused a lot on the maritime domain, mainly 5G focused more on the smart ports. Uh, there is a, a big, I think, uh, a, a big area of uh, research that uh, needs to be performed in order to cover all the operational uh, requirements uh, for this domain. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Nancy. So, a uh, very good uh, first kickoff and uh, maritime may become very important. Uh, we have to discuss whether there should be more on satellites or even uh, using terrestrial uh, more or less uh, low carrier frequencies. Okay, um, thanks a lot. Uh, our next uh, panelist is uh, Mr. Antonio Fernandez Barciella. He is actually our only car to x expert uh, today. So he's representing the complete um, automotive industry, uh, Antonio. So hope on your shoulders this will be not too heavy and you are a car to x expert uh, there someone is the merger of uh, fca and psa he graduated in teleco bigo uh, with long experience in mobile oriented projects and has a strong it background in network security and protocols he's experienced uh, as a voice and data architecture architectist and uh, for corporate mobile environments from 2012 working in an r d department of psa for connectivity projects. He is currently the World Group 5 Chair in 5GA for business models and go to market strategies. He is also project leader and contributor in national and international projects, for example, uh, 5G car, 5G Coco, innovation projects, uh, and he works closely with companies from the automotive and the IT world. He is also well known for Car2X, connectivity experts uh, holding several patents. Please, Antonio, the, the stage is yours. The floor is open for you. Thank you. Do you hear me? It's okay. Yeah. Yes, we hear From you. And you do see the, the slides. Yeah, that's okay. Yes. Okay, so uh, let's uh, start and give a little vision on the automotive side of what is. We, we keep the title of 6G because that's, that's the topic. But frankly, and I think this was uh, one of the things that is going to come back into, and Mark was very well explained at the very beginning. We are still in the process of adopting 5G uh, massively in the industry. And well, normally we would prefer to call it beyond 5G yeah? to avoid in general, the people thinking already about 6G before doing the adoption. But definitely this is something we will need to discuss. Yeah? Now 5G is already the present. So we should go and start thinking and working for 5G. Uh, in the case of the automotive, I would like to clearly say that 5G has been a disruption and it has provided a new way 
of dealing with the, the vehicle itself. And normally we call this, or you have heard about v you know, vehicle to anything communication, and what it is behind it. I think it's good to have a little vision of, of what we think. And uh, this, this, is, this is the way we see it. When we talk about v is it's not only uh, intelligent transport system communication, okay? This is the yellow part you see there. Indeed, in the v there are many things that are there. Yeah? We call, there is the part of the ITS, which is the relationship with other vehicles, with the infrastructure, the traffic, the pedestrian, but it's not only that. You know? Due to the extended vehicle paradigm, we will have to take, to pay attention to the vehicle to network and the part of vehicle to cloud. And finally now, we also think that the car is, is clearly, we made it in a factory and there is a relationship with the car as soon as it is born you know, with the factory so, so we do think vehicle to factory has to be taken into account. Yeah? The device today, the way we identify the user is, is thanks to his smartphone. And do not forget the current trend of the electrical vehicle that also comes with other options that we can call them or we can just put them behind the, the name of vehicle to grid, but that has different use cases. And well, that's the vision we've got, let's say, in terms of communication, our goal of uh, our group of ICT things that we will do, thanks to the communication, yeah? Put in, let's say, or um, eliminating the limits between the onboard and the offboard. The part of the electrical vehicle and the ITS is the way we, we there are things much more related to, to safety, yeah? If you have that in mind, then what coming up next, what could be the elements that we think could be interesting to have beyond what we are foreseeing in the current 5G uh, things that we're able to touch and that we see in the near future. So maybe uh, things related to the positioning, yeah? because clearly positioning is important and with the arrival of autonomous driving, it's, it's for sure one of the key aspects. Uh, we need to learn a little bit from the errors or the problems we have today. And maybe it is important to really get on a network perspective, a good way of combining all type of spectrum bands that we have today. So the ones used for sidelink, the ones used for talking to the infrastructure, even if they are licensed or licensed, well, this should be something really seamless in the way we use them, let's say. And 5G has provided a lot in terms of the latency, but with the vision of the RAN, you know, the radio access network. But we should go further. Yeah? It's not only part of the, the latency that we should pay attention to. It's the overall, because this is what pays, but it's going to be and going to have a big impact into the, the overall system. All the things that we have in mind, clearly the main revolution we're seeing today is the softwareization of the car. I'm sure you have seen already uh, this in many places in different companies. That is a fact there is ongoing. And in order to do that, well, the arrival with 5G already, as you can see in the image, the fact of distributing the cloud is the first step that's going to be important with this authorization, being able to move things, as I mentioned before, from the onboard to the offboard, to distribute it, to reconcentrate them. But we should go really beyond the current limits we've got, and this should be really a major trend. And having a network that is natively uh, AI ready, enabled, then we will use with the different applications at the moment, the different performances that we're able to get from outside the car from this environment. And maybe globally, well, Marcus has already mentioned about power savings. I do think this is important to, to pay attention to. And finally, with these global expectations, maybe, maybe uh, we need to change a little bit. In, in this um, moment that we are, where everything is changing in the talk world, in the OEM, new business model, new relationship, there are major disruptive vectors that are arriving. So maybe the case of the communication is going to change. Yeah? So it's no longer going to be a provider customer relationship but maybe a producer consumer option, a different paradigm in the way we, we make the relationship with the, with the network, with the communications, generally speaking. Finally, uh, it's crucial and clear 
that there is no way today to cover all the aspects just on a isolated way. We have been on our side pretty active in the case of 5G, uh, paying attention from the very beginning to the different initiatives. Mark was mentioning in the introduction, we are present in different projects and there is no other way. Open innovation is a must right now and it's gonna be even more important, I think, in, in the next generation, in this 6G. Uh, for 5G AA, I think this is clearly an association that, has, that was born with 5G. It will have to evolve and change the name because it is the first association. I think we're really both sides of the telecom, the automotive, we're able to work together and to push things in terms of mutual interest for both sectors. So uh, I think we will definitely have to, to, this is the good approach. It will be even busted for new generations. Even if I just evolved in the very last sentence of the previous slide, I think, and I think this is, is something we may, we may discuss on the end of the panel, 6G will definitely change the overall ecosystem as we, we see it today. Maybe 5G is the very last one where we stay, keep the same model we have today in terms of network communications, but it's just a thought to be discussed. That's all on my side, thank you. Thank Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Antonio. I like very much uh, the new acronyms you introduced, uh, V2G, V2D, V2C, and V2F. So uh, usually we talk about V2V and V2I and V2N, but now you introduced also things like power grid and, and uh, uh, cloud uh, and so on. Yeah, it's, it's a nice discussion and uh, looking forward for the discussion, uh, what we could expect uh, for 6G V2X in the future. Good, um, then I go to our third panelist, uh, Dr. Andreas Müller. He's the head of communications and network technology in the corporate research department of Robert Bosch GmbH in Stuttgart, Germany. At the same time, he's the uh, Bosch chief expert for communication technologies for IoT. In addition, he is coordinating the industrial 5G activities uh, at Bosch across different business units. He also serves as uh, chair, board chair of the 5G Alliance for Connected Industries and Automation, also known as 5G as here. It's a globally leading initiative for driving and shaping industrial 5G. A prior uh, to joining Bosch, Andreas was the search staff member at the Institute of Telecommunication at the University of Stuttgart, Germany, where he was contributing to the further development of the 3GP long-term evolution towards LTE advanced. Besides, he's uh, working or he was working as system engineer for Odin Schwartz, developing a novel software defined radio based communication system for the German armed forces. Andreas holds a German diploma degree as well as a PhD degree in electrical engineering with distinction and a master of science degree in information technology, all from the University of Stuttgart, Germany. So, welcome. And uh, Andreas, the floor is yours for your presentation, please. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Marcus, for the introduction and thanks for having me as part of this uh, interesting and timely panel. Um, so as you can see from the slides, hopefully you can see them in the right way. Yes. So that's a, a Bosch presentation, not a 5G SIA presentation. Um, and Bosch, of course, is a big player. We are active in quite a number of different domains, uh, different vertical domains, as you call them. Um, we are a leading IoT company, so therefore 5G already, but in future 6G, probably even more, is very relevant for basically all parts of our business. Um, and a good thing about being a representative of a vertical player here is that I don't have to come up with solutions. I just can throw in some uh, problems and ideas and requirements, and then it's uh, others having to take care of this, uh, Marcus maybe, and. Uh, other players more from the ICT industry. However, I also have to say, I have not really prepared now a list of use cases nobody has ever thought about before um, because that's still far away. And first of all, we also have to make sure that we get 5G right. Um, but I would like to highlight a little bit more general challenges and aspects that um, I consider to be important on the, for the transition from 5G to 6G. So in general, what does it take for another G? Um, if you look at the past, it's rather simple. So it takes about 10 years and it takes at least 10 times improvement. 
And if you just follow this, then you can just extrapolate um, what we now have with 5G and come up with a list of KPIs. And of course, this is something that is happening. Um, so that we say, okay, big data rates, 20, gig 20 gigabits per second for 5G. So let's make it one terabit uh, per second latency, one millisecond for 5G. Let's make it 0 0.1 milliseconds and so on. So I don't have to read all about this. Here. So of course, that's something that is being done currently. And it's also not completely wrong, but still we should not do things in the way they always have been done just because they always have been done like this. We really should question is it this? So is this then 6G or is there maybe should we have some more fundamental considerations and discussions about this? So this is what I want to trigger a little bit also with my presentation um, here and there, maybe also a little bit in a provocative manner. Because the new thing about 5G, of course, is that the, the verticals came in for the first time a bit late. Uh, Marcus mentioned this before, but now we are here and we will not go away anymore. So we have to live with us. Um, and of course, this is a change also in the ecosystem. And therefore, we really should rethink um, all the ways, all the things, um, if you're doing it still in the right way. So what does really matter now towards 6G? First of all, of course, vertical industries should be in the center of all considerations. With 5G, we came in, there was still strong focus on the consumer um, domain, consumer business, of course. Uh, that's how it started with this 15, especially. Um, now more and more features are being added for the verticals. In 6G, from the very beginning, we will be part of the discussions. We are having this panel today, uh, maybe 10 years, uh, eight years before market reduction, and we really should be in the focus of many considerations and discussions. However, if we look at standardization in TGVP, for example, there are only very few vertical players active, especially the big ones, uh, Bosch is one of them. And the reason for this is, of course, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, traveling, um, resources to be engaged in TGVP. But at the end of the day, usually only a fraction of the topics is really interesting for you. So if you come from the manufacturing industry, you're interested in manufacturing, but not in, even if it's very interesting in maritime, in agriculture, in automotive and so on. And of course, 5G is not part in the future 6G, not part of our core business. So it's a building block, but there are many other building blocks and we have to be able to manage all of them. So that's of course in 5G was one of the reasons why all the associations have been established for different verticals. And it's a really a good tool. So to bring the stakeholders together from the ICT industry and the vertical domains, and then to use these existing channels, especially from the ICT industry towards the GBP. So it's working okay, but it's not necessarily the optimal setup, right? So of course, vertical associations cannot really contribute themselves. They can serve as a forum to discuss things and to pre-consolidate contributions to VGBP, 5G SAA, so VGBP, MRP, as most of the others here as well. But still, we cannot make direct contributions. Only the member organizations can do that. And of course, as a vertical representative, you are somewhat still very much dependent on the goodwill and support of the ICT industry. So therefore, what I would like to trigger here is also really to rethink the way how we are doing standardization. Uh, is VGBP, at least in the way we have it today, is still the right forum for doing it? Or maybe do we have to change and adjust the working procedures a little bit to really make it easier for verticals to directly get involved also in standardization without having to hire 10 people just for doing that? So, but of course, there's more than that. Um, so what we also have seen with 5G now, and that's again very important, especially in the manufacturing industry, but also in, in other verticals, um, is the data of public networks, the private networks. Um, for many vertical applications, if we leave automotive and maritime and so on, maybe um, apart, but in many cases, these are local applications in agriculture, construction, healthcare, and it means we only require local connectivity. Um, and therefore, of course, the private networks, non public networks play an important role also to satisfy security, performance, and business related requirements. And if you look at the further evolution of 5G towards 6G, also here, the non-public network should become in the center of all considerations. So in 5G, what we have is basically still the public network and then some islands here and there um, with non-public uh, networks. So the NPN islands with 6G, I could imagine it's getting the other way around. So that we have many highly dedicated, tailored private networks, non-public networks serving specific needs. They are connected somehow. There are maybe some islands for the consumer business. Of course, I mean, it still plays a certain role, but it also if you look at other developments like uh, terahertz communication and so on, we won't see a nationwide rollout and deployment anyway. 
So 6G really as a network of non-public networks. And of course, the regulatory, regulatory situation in different countries that we're seeing supports this. More and more countries are allocating spectrum for local, loca local allocations, which is from the perspective, again, of an, a vertical player like Bosch, a very good thing. Um, what you also consider important is the developments towards open run. So that's starting today and it's going on today with the idea to get away from these more closed systems with proprietary hardware and software to highly modular virtualized systems with open interfaces and, and open APIs. And we consider this as very interesting, first of all, and very with a lot of potential. Of course, there are also some challenges still that need to be overcome and just be verified that it's really working. But the major promises being the reduced infrastructure costs, I think that's clear. So there, this was one of the main drivers for the Open RAN initiative, but it also allows then an easy optimization, for example, of the networks for specific vertical domains, thanks to the virtualization and this highly modular nature of um, Open RAN solution, and also ideally the simplified management and operations, thanks to the RIC um, and so on in, in the run. So therefore we really see a lot of potential here, especially if it's combined with non-public networks. So that might be a perfect cup, uh, couple for many um, applications. Another important development, and that's now a bit more technical at least, is of course the, the trend towards um, higher frequencies. Um, we have FR1, FR2 with 5G millimeter wave is a reality. And of course, terahertz is at the horizon. And also this is very um, promising because there's a lot of data rate available. Positioning is very important in many domains. This has been mentioned before, manufacturing, for example, it would be very good to have a positioning solution which supports one centimeter accuracy, for example. And again, terahertz, I mentioned this already, is primarily suitable for local applications because of the very challenging propagation uh, characteristics with a limited um, range. But it also has intrinsic security inbuilt, right? We cannot penetrate walls. That means uh, it's very hard to jam a system running on terahertz. And at the same time, very hard maybe to eavesdrop on a channel if you are sufficiently far away. So that makes it also quite interesting but also especially these integrated secondary applications that are currently being discussed. Um, there is a lot of potential again in different um, application environments, be it integrated radar for the automotive business, be it material inspection or quality control in manufacturing, or be it some kind of activity detection inside a car. So many things that we're currently exploring, what you could do with it, and these additional functionalities certainly may provide significantly a significant value add in many verticals. What we also will see um, further, and again, it started with 5G, is the shift from B2C, from a B2C business to a B2B business. Uh, and it comes along that it's not an emotional buying behavior anymore, but a purely uh, return on invest driven investment decision. If you look at manufacturing, agriculture, and so on. So nobody will deploy a 5G network in a factory just because it's nice to have one. It's always a uh, very uh, clear calculation. What does it cost? What is the benefit? And the benefit should be significantly higher than the cost. So therefore, TCO optimization should be a major design criterion from the very beginning. And of course, the question is, how can we bring the TCO, the total cost of ownership down? Well, we should think about tailored equipment on the infrastructure side and also highly modular um, equipment versus building one base station that can satisfy all the needs for all the verticals and so on. And again, here open run, for example, is something that might help to achieve that. The same for the device side, uh, tailored chipsets and um, SOCs. If you look at, again, an application effective, for example, if you don't need support for 2G, 3G, 4G, we can start with 5G only. Um, that means multi-mode um, modems are not needed. And we also don't need all the other features necessarily that are on the chip. So maybe there can also be a dynamic feature activation along with new business models so that we really get and pay for what we really need. Operations can be simplified. Network automation, of course, is a big topic. Zero touch management supported by artificial intelligence, machine learning. We also should think about royalties for, for patents and so on. So that's, there are more and more concerns in the ecosystem. There are also some prominent cases, of course, already. And again, for vertical players, it's a building block, but it's not a core business. And therefore the building block should not put too much risk on the current business. Otherwise we simply won't use that building block and everybody has to be aware of that. And also energy consumption, which is, um, also related to the sustainability goals, of course, and also here, non-public networks, for example, may help 
simply because the infrastructure is getting closer to the application and also the general cloudification of infrastructure may help as well. And the last thing that I would like to highlight um, is that we should also look at things in a holistic manner. So with 5G, what we are trying or what have we have been trying basically is to make a wireless 5G link as good as a cable. So that's how we came up with the one millisecond latency requirement, this 5469's communication service availability. Because at the beginning, people approached me and, and colleagues and others asking, what do you need? And we didn't really know. So we looked at our applications today. Today we use a cable and they said, okay, let's have it as good as a cable. And it works. I mean, that's the easy solution. We can just replace a cable using 5G. But of course, it's not necessarily the real optimum that we get. So if we consider things in, in a more holistic manner so that we have an application and a communication infrastructure that is interacting and maybe an overall management that controls both parts, can we make things and realize things in a different way? For example, getting away from uh, classical closed loop control applications with fixed communication cycles to more events triggered control systems. What does this mean then for the communication infrastructure? And at the end of the day, it may result in a situation where we even have relaxed requirements compared to what we have today with 5G. I'm not saying that this is always the case for all the requirements and so on, but this holistic view and, and optimization certainly is something that is worth um, more time and consideration. And at the end, it may also then bring the costs down and costs are still one of the more, most serious challenges, I would say, with 5G today. So that's a brief wrap up. IoT first, verticals in the center point of all discussions, the same for non-public networks. Cost optimization really as a key requirement. These new features are very promising, integrated sensing and also the holistic view is very important. And with that, I'm at the end of the short presentation and back to you. Thanks a lot, Andreas, for this very comprehensive uh, overview. I think you only uh, you did not only touch uh, manufacturing, but also other private networks, uh, maybe for the e-health sector or maybe education, whatever you like to see. And this uh, combination of uh, a network of networks uh, that uh, you have a lot of non-private networks which are being connected, uh, let's say, or fixed line or wireless together. Maybe this is a good idea. Uh, Let's go forward. I think uh, very good general presentation. I would like to introduce uh, the next speaker. Now we come to the topic e-health. Professor Christoph Tümmler is a physician uh, and the clinical lead of the Clinic for Care of Elderly at uh, Leipzig Park Clinicum and head of Center of Care at, uh, of the Elderly of Leipzig Region. He has also been professor of e-health with Edinburgh Napier University since 2010. He has been working with wireless technologies, the Internet of Things, uh, mobile radio technologies in the health domain for more than 20 years. Professor Trubler was an advisor to the EC and uh, the EU China Roundtable on IoT and also served as convener of the 5G health vertical uh, of 5GP in the first years of the project campaign. Amongst many other publications, he contributed to Mobile World Congress conference papers and the 5G health vertical white paper which was published, I think, uh, six years ago. Lately, he implemented the first uh, 5G hospital campus network in Europe at uh, Helios Campus, uh, Leipzig, uh, Germany. The initiative has been funded by the state of Saxony. Testing and validation of the facility has, uh, has seriously commenced and the 5G campus network should be ready for testing innovative medical technology by summer 21. He is the founder of the 6G Health Institute, uh, which will focus on standards and specification of 6G for the health domain. Now, uh, welcome Professor Tümmler, and uh, I think I need to start playing his video. Uh, so let me try whether this will work. So I need also to share my screen. Okay. So I hope you hear everything. Markus, I can't see the, the video. I can only see your. I can oh, only hear the video. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I don't want to. I, I need to. Point of care. Good point. I need to change. Perfect. That. Now you should see it. Ladies yes. and gentlemen, thank you very much for the kind Thanks. invitation to that workshop. And I would like to take the opportunity to introduce 
my slides to you. I've heard I've 10 minutes, so um, I better make that fast. So the title of my presentation is 6G Dynamic Medical Services, Shifting the Point of Care to the Point of Need. So what's up? Um, I think it's important to understand that uh, the health GDP share has outgrown automotive in Germany. And uh, it's a rising share. And it's very important to see that health is becoming an increasingly important industrial vertical, not only in Germany, but in Europe and in the entire world. Um, another aspect that is very important to the topic is um, the demographics. Aging societies, they will um, outgrow hospital capacity within the next 20 years, not only in, in Europe, but also in every other part of the world, including China. What is new? Why do we need 5G and 6G developments? Well, you know, um, the even 4G technology is just a plain bit pipe. It's just a pipe where we transport data. And um, this is something which is not the appropriate environment for future technologies. So if we are thinking about smart medical solutions, if we think about things like hospital at home, where we take care um, of more and more patients outside the hospital, which is absolutely necessary in the future, we will need more smart networks, more smart environments. And um, this is also to mention that, for example, the German um, medical technology industry, the medtech vertical, it's extremely powerful and fast growing with a turnaround of about 33 billion euros per year, most of that through export and uh, I think it is very, very uh, important to understand that this is a future technology. And the MedTech vertical has also been identified in China as a very important um, technology and it plays a key role in the Chinese Made in China 2025 state program. Why do we need more than 4G? I mean, I hear that very frequent and you're all familiar with that uh, argument that people say, yeah, but why is it that you really need that kind of throughput of these new technologies? Well, I've just brought together the user needs here and the 4G limitations. It becomes very quickly um, visible why that is the case. I mean, as I said, 4G is a static bit pipe. Um, there is no system intelligence within the network only in the terminals and we have to try to bring the intelligence into the network and bring this together with cloud technology and fog technology there is no end user control really i mean the control is with the uh, telcos with the organizations but end users cannot really influence the technology um, there is no network stratification at the point of access so i cannot say well this is my network and i want to split it like this or like that all of this is a future of 5G and beyond. And um, then, of course, speaking about the Internet of Technology, uh, the Internet of Things, um, it, is, um, it is very, very difficult, if you think of a big hospital, uh, to find ways how to interconnect all of these things in the future. If you have thousands and thousands or tens of thousands IoT devices in a hospital, 4G will not be able to manage that. Um, of course, you all know about the limited speed of 4G, you, you know about the limited latency um, that is required for 5G and above services. You have to think about safety, security, reliability and resilience. All of these things are not, sit not very well with 4G technology, which, as I said, initially is only a pipe, a big pipe, and there is no intelligence in the system. On the other hand, the um, facilities for smart distributed solutions, um, that, that is really something that will determine the healthcare of the next uh, 10, 20 years, where we need more smart solutions. Uh, the healthcare provider will be providers of these smart solutions. The business models will change and so forth. And there is a completely different user need for that. We need systems that can integrate um, devices across networks um, and across technologies, which is not the case in the moment. The 
the users, they will want to have far more control, control that goes together with the uh, general data protection regulations, for example, here in Europe. So we will be able to determine the security, the throughput. We will be able to determine what kind of services will be available at what point and so forth. Um, network slicing is a feature which we need, definitely will need in order to build the future healthcare industry and um, we, we will use 5G technologies even more so uh, as an enabler for the medical Internet of Things, which um, is the only way how we will be able to manage our aging populations in the future. The problem that we have at the moment is that 5G is not even properly rolled out uh, in the health domain. So why are we advocating now 6G? Well, the problem is that the healthcare industry never really participated um, in, the, um, in the 5G technology build-up. And uh, there are only very few proposals that came out of the health domain into the, the RAN group or into 3GPP. So in the moment, it is not really clear what is actually in the releases 15 to 17, let alone 18 with regards to 5G. We have no idea and we need to a comprehensive work up on this. So um, my organization, the 6G Health Institute, will look into details of the releases over the next year or so in order to figure out in more detail what is it actually that we have, what is it actually that we need, and what will it be that the future health industry will desperately need. And in my opinion, there will be a gap between this and uh, what is going to be the agenda for the 6G movement. Um, it is completely unclear whether the requirements of the hospitals for the next 10 years have been met um, under the 5G agenda. Most likely it is not the case. So we will have to look at these things and establish a 6G agenda, which is extremely important. And we also have to integrate the demands of a health 4.0 industry, an industry that is not defined by hardware, um, but is more so defined by services and uh, very much defined so by the tendency to treat more patients outside the hospital than inside the hospital. And um, this brings me to the 6G use case example. I won't leave without letting you know what, for example, the idea is behind these new services. Think about the use of um, implants. And we're seeing a lot of people that are suffering from atrial fibrillation, so an uncontrollable rhythm disturbance of the heart, and which is a big problem to us. So we see many of these people in the hospital. And um, we need a network structure. We need software solutions that allow to treat these people outside the hospital in a completely different manner. We need to monitor them. And if there are any problems, we need to be able to interfere with these implants. And it needs to be safe, it needs to be secure. And if these people have to be transported with an ambulance to the hospital, then the whole machine needs to interact with the ambulance network on the way. And there are different requirements, namely, you know, there must be no electrical impulses or no shocks that being applied to the patient that could endanger the ambulance crew. And at the same time, the heart needs to be monitored all the way through. And then the patient comes into the hospital where therapy and diagnosis start. And then the, this device has to become part of that hospital network seamlessly without any problem through therapy and diagnosis. And when the patient goes back home, all of these new settings of this device need to be automatically adopted. Um, this is a very complex example. There are others, but we need to be, we need much more flexibility than we have at this point in time with 4G that we may have with 5G. So it's a completely different uh, system, different universe, and this needs to be understood. And I can tell you also that with the um, 5G um, to 6 transition, the roles of the players, the classical roles, they're going to change. The business models are going to change. Health service providers will take on roles what used to be part of the healthcare, of the, of the telecommunication 
uh, of the network providers and uh, vendors and network providers will have to take on other roles. This is coming, this is already set, this is our healthcare of tomorrow. Um, with this, I'm going to, to leave you and say goodbye. I'm really looking forward to a vivid discussion on the day on the 11th of June. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thanks a lot, Christoph. So I stopped sharing and hopefully you can now listen back to normal mode. So thanks a lot for this very interesting talk and you completely right. I think um, uh, health was late compared to automotive and uh, manufacturing. And uh, it would be, uh, I think, time-wise important now to consolidate uh, health requirements uh, with many uh, medtech companies and, and stakeholders. And maybe we need another association which, which uh, uh, catches up with uh, 5G and 5G as here to also consolidate these different streams and ideas and to be a real uh, market representation partner to uh, 3GP uh, to speak with unique voices. Okay, thanks a lot. I, I will now continue with uh, our last uh, two speakers now become to our mobile network or operator colleagues. Uh, first is uh, Mr. Patrick Thibault. He joined NTT Docomo in 2005 as senior manager, standardization and was responsible for 3GP, SA1, SA2 activities as well as Etsy and NGMN activities within uh, NTT Docomo global standardization team. During that time, he pioneered the 4G LTE new core architecture transformation, all IP, and started many uh, new studies and academies like uh, M2M. He is now director of uh, Docomo Laboratories Europe, uh, whose role is to develop the necessary 5G and NFP standards within TGP, let's say NGMN, 5G SEA, 5GA, in order to accelerate the deployment of 5G services to a broader ecosystem. In particular, he started a trilateral collaboration on V2X with both telecom vendors and KOM in Japan and Europe. He's currently elected board member of 5J. Please, uh, Frederick, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes, and can you see you. the slide? Yes, we you. Good, then let's start. Uh, by the way, I'm no longer uh, bored of 5GA. I was like, that was my term was until uh, May last month, but okay. That's uh, something I sent just uh, um, before, of course, the, the conference. So let me uh, start here with uh, not a controversial, I mean, uh, but uh, uh, clearly uh, as uh, the previous speakers were mostly, of course, uh, coming from the verticals, of course, now I represent the other side, I mean, the MNO uh, side of, uh, of the equation. And uh, we are not here, of course, to bring uh, new vertical requirements. They have to come, of course, from, from, the, from the verticals. Uh, but the, um, the problem is, uh, in fact, what we need to do is uh, actually, uh, um, if, if, if possible, uh, co-create uh, those services. So it's not an exercise that needs to be done uh, simply by having on one side the MNO and on the other side the vertical, but it's really uh, trying to uh, work together. So this is what uh, Docomo has done for uh, 5G co-creation from the beginning we were looking at how can we bring uh, verticals uh, the this was not of course as we pioneer that an easy exercise as many people said here uh, 3gpp was done uh, to actually uh, make a more consumer type of services so when we came with the vertical requirements they were picked one by one so some were picked like automotive and then after uh, the uh, industry for the zero some are still not picked like uh, the previous speaker explained uh, clearly the health is is not the the number one here so if i'm going here as i'm being a little bit uh, controversial my first to change the slide, sorry. Um, I, I will try to explain, I mean, the view of an MNO, we're trying to kind of help uh, dissolve the borders uh, between MNOs and verticals. We don't want to be in silo, say, oh, there is the 
industry 4.0 and they are totally separated from the automotive and totally separated. We as MNO, we talk to everybody. We see many, many verticals. We see it's really, uh, of course, with 5G uh, in something very exciting, but of course we, are, we really want to make this open to everybody. How can we do that? There's a few things that we can do. The very first one is, uh, and we, we talk about more this extreme requirement, we will go to more extreme flexibility. That's really something that needs to be done from 5G to, uh, to 6G. I put here the word, no more walls. Uh, when I'm hearing that someone wants to make uh, his own network and is not thinking of uh, the other requirements, I mean, I don't know if we say, okay, automotive needs to be just automotive and industry 4.0, just industry 4.0, we are creating walls. And if we create walls, there will be no flexibility. And what we need really in CIGG is even more flexibility, especially in the cloud. Let's say When you say you need to have either a distributed or edge or semi-centralized or centralized, no, we want, we want something that is totally open here uh, from the cloud native. We say that's something we wanted to have in 5G. We did it for a few enterprise, but we need it for everyone. We need also to have no more uh, walls between RAN and core. We saw in 3GPP, radio has been always studied on one side, the core network on the other side, and then sometimes we are trying to align. Now it's time to actually have one view end to end. I think I heard that in the conference many times. Spectrum may also be interesting. It's like, yes, I'm sometimes in favor to have dedicated spectrum for dedicated use and eventually not managed by operators. We saw that in, uh, in, uh, in a few uh, verticals, but we have to be careful. Every, if I'm reserving a, a spectrum for one usage, then the other guys will not have access to that spectrum and it may be important. So in 6G, I rather see again, if possible, no walls. I mean, that's really a principle we should start from. Uh, also, what's important in those extreme requirements is going to an extreme flat uh, topology. Uh, having something where we think of, uh, we have uh, three stars, whatever, I mean, that doesn't make sense anymore. We have to have something totally uh, flat, uh, totally like low latency mesh network. Uh, I saw in the one of the presentation a mesh of NPN network. That's one possibility, but it's even we need to go even further. I mean, totally flat, reconnect here uh, all enterprise. The data of the enterprise is the value. I mean, we we know that many companies are doing their business out of the data, and we need to actually make those data uh, change the paradigm here through a flat topology. Another very important thing is many people talk about it being extremely smart. Uh, being extremely smart means for us as an MNO, we look at being extremely autonomous. I mean, run everything with the intelligence. So it means the intelligence has to be everywhere. So for that, and 4G, uh, 5G was about uh, cloud native, 6G will be native uh, native AI. I think it's clearly where we need to have here this uh, extreme AI, uh, AI in all of the elements, in the radio, in the core, in the application, in the API, expose the intelligence of the network is a key uh, factor to make 6G uh, here an, of interest for everyone. And finally, I would say, and that's maybe contradictory to all the other three, being extremely simple. If we make solutions that are even more complex, uh, we will even break, I mean, CG will be, not be able to be, in fact, accessible by small enterprise, for example. Uh, our technology have been always easy to use by consumer. We need also to continue to be easy to use by enterprise. We have to simplify whatever we can, stack options, not having, uh, because many options limits the interoperability, and basically continue to be low cost, we saw with the pandemic that uh, uh, the, the 
the network was even more important, but the money, I mean, clearly was uh, uh, not always, uh, I mean, going uh, uh, easily. Uh, many small companies were affected by the pandemic and clearly making solutions that, that are even more cost effective is important to make 6G uh, accessible. Basically, my conclusion, I'm making here the speech very short, what we want is clearly make 6G a game changer. I mean, like 5G was, but 5G was a game changer for a few enterprises, as we saw, for a few verticals. I think it's important to make 6G a game changer for every enterprise. The smallest enterprise needs to benefit from 6G. And for them, it's important that the IT is no longer be a huge cost, but the IT is now becoming even a revenue generator. And if we not only thinking of technology, but also changing the business paradigm, then we will make SIGG a success. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Frederick. I think you're completely right. Uh, we had uh, more or less uh, automotive manufacturing uh, the first uh, uh, uptakers for 5G a couple of years ago, but uh, other vertical industries are still not uh, awake, I would say, like uh, e-health or maybe what we have seen maritime. And uh, it's also time now to engage uh, these uh, people. Now, let's go to our last panelist, George uh, Garza. He is executive board member at the NOS uh, SGPS group as uh, CTO and information officer. He leads all technology development, uh, deployment and operations, including mobile and fixed networks, IT infrastructure and service platforms. In recent years, he led the transformation of NOS network, preparing for the arrival of 5G and edge computing technology. George started his career at Boston Consulting Group. His entire professional path has been the telecommunication industry. George has held positions in planning and control, strategic convergence and television services at Portugal Telecom and was director of uh, ZON, Zone TV, Cable, responsible for product and marketing areas. He has a Bachelor in Management from the University of uh, uh, Catalonia, uh, Portuguese, and an MBA in Analytical Finance and Marketing from Northwestern University, uh, Kellogg School of Management. Please, George, you are the last uh, panelist and very important. Please start your presentation. Can you, can you hear me? I think yes. I'm already sharing. Yes, yes we are here. Uh, it's only um, uh, the screen sharing uh, is, is not sorry. perfect. Yeah. If it's yeah, no, it's yeah. good. Okay, so <clears throat> first of all, a little bit my a little bit of a sore throat. So let's let's hope if <laughs> my voice holds up uh, during the presentation. Well, uh, first of all, he hello everyone. Uh, let me thank the presentation for uh, the organization for the opportunity to to participate in this panel. Um, I want to give you uh, uh, the M and O perspective and a little bit uh, what we're seeing from the very, very early stages of the deployments that we were already doing with, uh, with 5G. Um, I think uh, you've, you've seen uh, graphs like this, but, I, but, but I, what I wanted to share with you is this is a little bit the perspective that we, that we have from the MNO. And the key message here is this is this is an ecosystem that it looks very messy from our perspective our traditional uh business is much more centered than, uh, around some core services but as we move to the introduction of 5g the 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 number of use cases and the number of solutions that we've been that we're being asked to participate and help implement just ex just explodes and i think that today objectively the biggest challenge that we have is with the business model both from our perspective from the mno perspective but also from the businesses that are looking at the technology the economic equation is unbelievably complex uh, uh, and it becomes exponentially more as we move to the verticals and to the private network uh, uh, areas um, so the value is there. I think that the biggest issue is how do we transition and how do we move together to get to deploy those, those solutions. So from the early, early deployments, uh, I think I can identify three key areas of concern 
that from a technology standpoint we have with, with 5G. I think I'll, I'll try to be brief to, to, I think some of the points uh, uh, have been already touched by the panelists before, but I think there, there's three key points here that we're seeing in the deployments. One of the biggest concerns is uh, power consumption. Uh, and power consumption, not only from uh, the running costs, if we look at what today, the jump that we have in terms of power consumption and those requirements, uh, when we compare 5G with 4G, we're, lo we're looking at a dramatic increase. So uh, it, it becomes, it goes beyond the threshold of how do we economically then support the service because there's a there's economic equation here and obviously we need the the, the full cost of the operating in such a network will will need to be supported be it by the b2c use cases be it by the b2b use cases but not only from a running cost but also from a, a just a pure deployment of infrastructure the the requirements if we look at how to deploy a network with the current uh, requisites that we have for 5G in the normal use cases of dense urban areas, this poses by itself a huge deployment uh, deployment uh, issue. Um, so going forward and looking at all of the use cases and some of the examples that we have here, if we continue to, to pile up in terms of the requirements, uh, uh, more power consumption without regards of more efficient solutions, this, this will prove to be, this will take the challenge to a completely new level. The second area of concern needs, uh, has to do with uh, what I'm calling here edge compute. Um, I think here the biggest, and this is, I think, at least the, the last two panelists touched uh, uh, on this. I think my biggest uh, uh, criticism to what we have here is, we've had too much of an umbilical vision to the frameworks that we've, we've, we're attempting to push uh, forward. If we look at a lot of the use cases, I think, and we need to distinguish uh, uh, a little bit the big enterprises from then the mass number of the smaller companies or the medium-sized companies that won't be able to go fully custom or have the enough capabilities to actually manage that, that jump. If you look at the big mass of, of companies that will have to uh, move to, uh, into this technology in order to get the benefits that we're discussing here, we need to look at edge computing in a different way. It needs to be a collaborative approach. We need to bring into the table the cloud solutions, the hyperscalers, the private clouds, and we need a better solution that provides a seamless transition and a crossover between the domains while addressing all of the needs that we've discussed here of the, the use cases, latency, resilience, and so on. The third, the third point, I think it's, I, 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 I translate the third point to trust. And I think that we've talked a little bit in the, the previous two, two two panels about the mesh and the ability to, to think about the network in a, in a slightly way. Um, everything that we've been discussing with 5G and then 6G, 6G will build on top of that will require a fully programmatic approach to the network. If we project the number of network elements that we're talking about, the number of devices, so if we pile up all of the verticals, if we pile up all of the B2C use cases, the number of network elements, the number of slices, the number of SLAs rules that will have to be that the network will have to cater. Uh, we're build, we're looking at an endless level of complexity. So a centralized approach, which has been very much what we have today to this problem, will will it, it will become a bottleneck of, of performance and an unavoidable failure point. That as we're discussing mission critical services in some of these cases. Uh, we need to we need to, we need to address the, the, this approach is not compatible. So I think that we need to look at uh, a, a different. We need to think about a different way of how will the network, the topology of the network, how will the elements communicate, how will they interact? Do we build trust? How do we build trust into the network? How do we decentralize the approach? 
and allow a seamless interaction between all of the different components that we will have, be it verticals, be it uh, fully, uh, uh, fully incorporated services into the network. So the key, the, the, the key discussion point for me will be uh, 6G will come, a lot of these use cases will find that we've been discussing here will come to life, but they will have to come with a new economic model uh, because otherwise they, they, we won't be able to make the jump to, to really bring the technology to the masses and to all of the, 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 the enterprises. Otherwise it becomes, we will have a, techno a solution from a technology standpoint, but we will not have the ability from an economic standpoint to actually deploy the solutions and make and make them uh, uh, feasible. And I think in the interest of time for the discussion, Marcus, I think I'll, I'll finish. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, George. I think you, you uh, were uh, addressing points which, which uh, are urgently needed, like uh, trust, uh, how to control from user perspective, more or less uh, the network usage. Uh, I think this is now, uh, more than just a higher, faster and, and less latency. Um, so we need to also think about this, this improved uh, user uh, trust building so that the network is trustful and, and the user can control how the network is used uh, from his angle point of view. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, uh, George, for this very interesting point. Uh, I agree to the points that you raised. And now let me first check uh, if there are some questions um, in the chat. Yes, I see already some, some uh, first topics here upcoming. Uh, I read first um, the question, not sure whether the panelists can read it, uh, but uh, the question is as said by our panelists that 6G focuses more on treating patients outside hospital. How far does one think that medical problems like heart attacks, respiratory uh, distresses can be detected and treated at home with 6G? I think um, uh, there's only one uh, panelist who can answer that uh, question, uh, Christoph. Did you understand the question? So the question is, uh, how can 6G be used in mission critical use cases like heart attacks uh, at homes, for instance? Yeah, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> The question is uh, reasonable and I understand. Um, the 6G technology, 5G technology, and then 6G technology will certainly be used in emergency settings. So we have already use cases here around in our um, 5G uh, testbed um, that are looking into the use of these technologies in the, um, in the emergency ambulances and for the coverage of the emergencies. But I think the, the far more interesting question, and I said that in my uh, statement, our problem that we're facing in the future is not so much coined by acute emergencies. You know, in the first instance, we will be looking at people with chronic diseases. So the focus will be on how do we prevent acute emergencies in people with chronic diseases. And these people with chronic diseases, they will get more and more because the, the number of those people will grow with the demographic development of the industrialized countries, also China. So um, uh, intervention in emergency procedures or emergency strategies, yes, but I think the focus will be on prevention. Mm -hmm. I hope I hope this will come will provide an answer to to what was asked. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I think um, uh, when I uh, wrap up all the six uh, uh, panelists here, I see uh, more or less recurring statements. Um, uh, one point I noted down is about trust and uh, how the user um, uh, can trust the network. Uh, the question would be uh, maybe to George um, from my side, do we need a new interface from, from the user point of view? I would call it an HMI, human machine interface, or human uh, uh, network interface, which could give uh, the user more control where the data is processed. You mentioned uh, edge computing. Maybe some users don't want to have uh, their data processed on edge computing. Uh -huh. Maybe they prefer it to do it on, on a central cloud on a hyperscaler because they believe there is a higher security on a cloud center. 
uh, and also maybe the user wants to control uh, where the data is uh, routed uh, from A to B. So maybe you say, I don't want that my data goes outside of, of the country. So uh, I want to have this data only processed and networked in, in, in Portugal. Um, so uh, do you think this, this could make sense uh, to propose as a new business requirement for, for 6G or beyond 5G? I think uh, one of the, uh, for me, my, the, uh, regarding edge compute, the, the biggest concern uh, that we're seeing from the, the some of some of the the use cases that we're trying to help companies to deploy uh, has to do with the fact that most of the companies today are already using some sort, at least the most advanced they're using, are exploring the, the hyperscalers capabilities. So they're using cloud computing, they have data in the cloud, they're doing some, some using some of the, those, those services. As we're trying to implement the use cases, that data and the, the, the requirements that they have, and I think that we touched here, the latency, the end-to-end -end latency, that forces you to move closer. You need to bring part of that computing power, you need to bring the part of that data closer. How do you do that in a way that it's compatible with all of the different scenarios and situations where you need to build exactly some of those fences because not all of the data is in the, the public cloud, but how do you bring and how do you merge the two, the, two, uh, uh, the two worlds in one uh, uh, feasible solution for the, the enterprise without going into extreme complex situations where how do we, we handle security like you've mentioned? How do we handle the data sovereignty? How do I make sure that data doesn't flow from one side to the other? How do, when the two worlds touch, that needs to be, we, ideally we would standardize this approach and we would put this as a way where even the hyperscalers as they move to their edge compute solutions, because today they don't have a standard. We don't have a standard for that. We, if you talk with one provider, they will they will point towards one direction. The other will point to another one. And if you think about the, the, the level of complexity that, you, that, you, that we're talking here, it becomes, it becomes a hurdle so big that you need to be either a big corporate where you have enough capabilities to actually handle that. But if you're a smaller company, or you don't have that capability so well developed, it becomes very complex. And then how do you handle that? How do you, how do you actually do that movement? Because we're talking in most of these cases, we're, in these use cases, we're discussing mission critical. We're talking about production line. We're, we're talking about a lot, of, a, a, lot of, a, a lot of situations where you actually don't, I mean, you cannot uh, live with uncertainty, obviously. So it, there's there's requirements that are very high. So how to address that those touch that, that touch point is a clearly an area of concern. Yes, I fully agree. I think uh, this this uh, user control in terms of uh, where data is stored in the network, yeah. uh, where the data is uh, net uh, rooted, more or less, uh, uh, is it uh, leaving the national borders or not? I think there's nothing standardized. And uh, another point, uh, maybe um, uh, which goes to the direction of uh, Frederick, uh, energy management was mentioned. And also today, I think in CGP, um, we do not see such um, standardization uh, subgroups, uh, which could uh, reduce the energy consumption of uh, 6G nodes or whatever. So for example, you could shut down, if you don't need it, you shut down uh, the 6G base station. Uh, if it's a femtocell cell and so on. Would you see, uh, Frederick, that um, this, this uh, energy management um, could be a new group in 3GP uh, also to define cross manufacturer uh, energy management uh, control actions? Uh, is, is there a need in your view uh, that, that uh, 6G could be better standardized? Uh, energy management should be better standardized in 3GP, maybe. What do you think? Yeah, that's at least the benefits if we standardize it in 3GPP is like we can take into account a full, I mean, all the ecosystem. Because if we do it in just like the radio or just in uh, one of the industry, the problem is the solution will only reduce uh, the, the, the power consumption in, in one domain. 
So, I mean, like, for example, uh, either in the data center or either in, uh, in, uh, in the, uh, the, 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 like, uh, the what's going on into, uh, into a particular vertical. So my approach would be at least to try to see if it's feasible in, uh, in, uh, in free GPP. I know uh, if I listen to what, for example, Andreas said before, so he can probably have a, 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 a different view here. Um, but at least let's talk. It's clearly important as uh, uh, here, uh, we, if we have two different view, let's discuss and see what are the pros and cons. Uh, here, I think that still the benefits of 3GPP is we can, even if in a, some industry have difficulty to have their voice in, we can still have here and, uh, uh, the possibility to have some uh, common view and have an end-to-end -end view. And I think for SIGG, it's important if we want finally to attack this problem of uh, reducing the power to do it together. It's a collective exercise. Yes, a good point. So uh, there could be a chance maybe to have some kind of vendor, across vendor signaling for uh, energy reduction or switching off whatever of network uh, components or parts of the network or even in the base station you could switch off. But this must be done across manufacturer. So this would be uh, in that case a clear need to, to break that up uh, and to discuss between different manufacturers. Now, now maybe um, when we talk about um, uh, 6G, we have heard about a lot of uh, less delays, higher bandwidth, higher liability. So uh, maybe a very uh, hard question to Andreas. Um, what is your guess when, when you look on, on the, uh, let's say, manufacturing applications today, you can realize with, with 5G, how of them uh, are left for 6G? So let's assume you could address maybe 6% uh, today uh, uh, of the applications by 5G, let's say at least uh, 15, 16. Uh, and uh, what is your estimate? Do you have such a number? How many leftovers uh, uh, could be still to be addressed for the evolution of 5G or even 6G? Yeah, thanks, Marcus. And that's, of course, the one of the key questions here. Um, but it's not so straightforward, right? I mean, it goes along the lines of what I presented at the end of my presentation. So if you ask me how many use cases we can realize with 5G, you are basically asking how many use cases that we have today can be changed somehow, for example, by replacing a cable using 5G, right? Then I could give you a percentage and I can say, okay, 90% maybe that we could replace a cable using 5G. But I think that the real potential comes if we make things in completely different ways and maybe there are completely new use cases that simply were not possible in the past because we did not have the right technologies, right? So, and that's of course something like looking into the crystal ball, because if I knew the answer, what the new use cases would be and, and completely new approaches, then I would not sit here, but I would start my startup or startup and uh, <laughs> try commercial <laughs> this. So, uh, so therefore it's hard to give a percentage. I think the first step really would be to make sure that the full 5G promise becomes a reality, because also here we are not there yet. And this is a learning now also from this close collaboration between the ICT industry and in the case of manufacturing, the, the industrial domain, um, because we have, for example, this one millisecond latency requirement, right? And of course this comes because manufacturers like Bosch said, we need one millisecond latency or we are running load control loops at one millisecond, but we usually mean then cycle times. And what we get now with 5G today at least, um, is not a one millisecond cycle time. In the best case, it's maybe a one millisecond one way latency and so on. So there are still things that need to be delivered to make the full 5G vision become a reality. And then we should really think a little bit more radical, uh, get away from just replacing a cable and um, also think about how can we change the application per se, right? If we have AI as a service in a network, for example, I mean, if it's a big neural network and so on, so then there are completely new things possible uh, that we cannot even envision yet. Um, and I'm very confident there is a lot of value in this, not just the manufacturing, but also many other vertical domains. And that's why it's so important really to have this joint discussions today. But let me just make another brief comment uh, on the, the previous question actually, because uh, Frederick also just mentioned me. Uh, this was about the, uh, of course, again, role of GPP, because I want to make sure that I'm not misunderstood. So I'm not saying, or I was not saying before, VGPP should not be the forum in order to standardize 6G. I was just questioning 
the way how things are being done right now in PHPP because there's a history behind this. But now we have new applications, we have new stakeholders, the verticals, for example, with new business models from B2B, uh, from B2C to B2P. Um, so ecosystem changes, business model changes, but we leave the way how we're doing standards in exactly the same way. This can be okay, but personally, I think we should really at least really rethink the way we are doing things. And uh, Frederick, what you, what you mentioned before yourself basically would be one example where it would make sense because you said we should not think uh, separately of RAM and core, but it's the way how HTTP is organized, right? So, um, and also even some small changes may already help maybe to better suit the needs basically um, of all stakeholders and to, to have a better fit basically to what we need for 6G. So I just wanted to make this uh, point clear again. Yeah, good point, Andreas. Uh, maybe uh, we could have in the 3GP some kind of advisory board where, where verticals and, and telecom players are working together and try to agree on a consensus. What, what is the priority, let's say, uh, for the next release or maybe upcoming releases? Uh, and, and this, of course, uh, could be a chance uh, to have your voices heard in, in that. Today, you know, it, it works like by voting. So you just have 1,000 telecom engineers uh, speaking against one vertical uh, engineer and then uh, it could be that the most likely that this vertical engineer doesn't uh, uh, is not be heard and, and probably has no chance to uh, put the requirements on the table but maybe some kind of advisory um, in the TGP uh, on that respect could be also useful okay yeah uh, next question Marcus, to may, may Antonio just, ah Marcus, Antonio I was just uh, trying to engage you but please yeah, but indeed, I'm, faster. I'm, here. I'm, I'm just thinking about what we are talking yeah and and you know in the automotive we're always really sensitive about cost. Yeah? But indeed, I'm having a look at all the elements that were mentioned in the different presentation of my colleagues. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, you can find all of them that cost one, one of, the, of the vectors. Yeah? And, and I think this is something we all need to take into account because finally, you know, you can be a technology company, but technology is to be used for something. So uh, we have to keep that in the full, in the full equation. What I mean with this, not only for the people here, I don't find a regulator, yeah? but just to say before, we were discussing about a spectrum. So they have to be there and, and indeed, we could say whatever, it's going to be costly. So we need UEs and UEs, they need to adopt the new technology. For this, there is an extra cost. And to get this extra cost, then we need, or in the past, we need infrastructure. Infrastructure needs a spectrum. So, you know, we have to be all together. It's not worth to say, yeah, cost is a major vector. And then, and I'm not pointing anybody in concrete, yeah, some administrations will look for a spectrum as a way of funding, you know, being funded. And this is clearly a barrier for everybody. So if there's cost for the spectrum, then is a cost for the deployment. It's going to be a problem for the network, a problem for the UI, and the system will not move on, you know. So, so clearly speaking, we are all uh, this 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 partnership of the TCO. We're all on the same page. Yeah. So we That's do true. need every one of us. Yeah. And this is something where six year may help. And we have yeah. struggled. Or we we always see that as a problem today. Yeah. Which going to come true. first? Is the infrastructure? Is the UE? We need UEs to have infrastructure. We need infrastructure to have UEs. So I, I definitely think that cost should be put. The, the overall cost. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah a good point. I'm from, from all the time, as I like, in quotes, an obsession for the success of 16. Yes, a uh, good point. I was just about uh, um, uh, raising a question to you, and it goes in the same direction, uh, Antonio. Uh, when we look on, on the promises uh, for automated driving, you know, connected automated driving, uh, CAD, and so on, uh, then, then of course, there could be a potential for 6G or beyond 5G um, uh, to offload processing power from the machine uh, to the edge computing in order to save energy costs on the electrical car in order to save costs on the processing platform. Could you see this as a potential for the future? Because when we see all this terror, bits, you know, and, and, and huge bandwidth, you know, what, what uh, maybe a car can uh, shoot out. Uh, is this a way uh, to explore further, uh, to, to have it, it is, better it offloading? Is indeed, yeah, it is indeed one. We uh, tried to mention in the presentation, this civilization we're living, okay? And in this civilization, obviously, and maybe things will change in the future, but the life cycle of a car has nothing to do with 
the environment. And the way we're able to upgrade servers, to put more servers, uh, everything linked to the, the power processing that we're able to put off board is going to be really beyond what we're able to put on board. And do not forget that mobility has to be something affordable. Yeah, Then you can have even options. But if we're able to put things outside the car, then again, you're able to do mobility cheaper. And this is, there is no doubt, this is today a trend. Uh, we can enter into the details, but all the companies um, where I work for and the others, we're all sovereignization, this, this process, this trend of sovereignization. And as soon as you no longer have a piece of metal, but you have a soft, then you're able to move it. Yeah. And then you really have to rely on the infrastructure. So yeah. Thank, thanks a lot, Antonio. Sure. And Antonio, uh, just a, a quick question to, to, to Nancy. Nancy, you mentioned beginning uh, satellite, uh, uh, we should get rid of satellite maritime. Uh, do you think that uh, we have also uh, terrestrial networks for ships or is, is this a misunderstanding that only yeah. satellites can be used for? Uh, basically, uh, I think uh, I agree with, with the uh, people uh, that talked before also with Antonio about the cost. Uh, they cannot read, of course, the satellite, but there, there needs to be some progress in reducing the overall cost for the maritime sector and increase uh, the speeds and capacity of the network. Because uh, for the moment in the maritime, uh, when the ship is en route, they have uh, to, to rely on some kilo BPS sometimes in order to... To, to establish their, their connectivity. So you can imagine uh, the difference in terms of uh, the demand and uh, what they get as, as a service. So it, it's both the cost, the, the speed, and the capacity of the network. And I think hybrid uh, networks can provide some solutions there. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I, I think we, we have um, to uh, more or less come to an end. Uh, obviously, some chats. There will be also, I think, a plenary after this uh, uh, panel here. So I would have uh, uh, liked to extend more or less for the next one hour to talk to you. And uh, there are so many questions around this topic. So maybe next time we should get more uh, minutes to talk. Uh, this is, was very sharp, these 25 minutes in the question and answer round. I would like to thank you all of you, six uh, excellent talks and, and very good questions and discussions. And also, I uh, would like to thank the audience uh, for raising questions and, and uh, following the very interesting discussions. So uh, thanks again. And I think we have now uh, to quit quite soon and hope to see you in the future face to face when this pandemic times is over. We have more, let's say, more fun and more discussions hopefully in the future. Thanks a lot to all of you. Thank bye you bye. All. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Thanks again. Bye.